Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And at long last, welcome back to another Skyrim Mods video, where we take a look at some of the greatest and latest in-game content being manufactured by the community. It's been actual months since we did our last one of these videos, mostly because I got so absorbed into experimenting with other content. But we're back. And in the time I've been away, so much has changed on the Nexus, and some amazing, dare I say, top 5% creations have emerged that I'm very excited to break down. In fact, there's one specifically I'm really hyped about. But anyway, without any further ado, let's do further. Starting off, we'll be beginning today with the newest mod on this list, Revenants of the Forbidden Order by McCarthy4, which just dropped a few days ago on May 8th. Revenants is, by and large, an armor and weapon pack, creating two new custom armor sets and a new sword and staff, all with high-quality custom models and textures, affording resolutions as high as 4K, though you can download more performance-friendly variants as well. The first armor set I'd like to show off is the Knight Cleric Armor, which combines black gothic steel plates with red fabrics and golden accents to create a very dark fantasy-esque vibe. From a statistical standpoint, this set's pretty much identical to Daedric armor, though look at it, it's pretty neat. The new sword, the Knight Cleric Montant, I think I'm pronouncing that properly, also does the exact same damage as a normal Daedric greatsword, with the same swing time. Then there's the very impressive Archdeacon robes, which are really just two pieces, the chest robes themselves and a funny hat, neither of which offer any damage protection, yet do look admittedly amazing and damn elegant if I do say so myself, resembling something you'd see a bishop wear. Coming with these fantastical fabrics is the Staff of Cleansing Pyres, which will create a wall of flames doing roughly 50 points of damage. All of this new gear is appealing enough, but something I've yet to mention is that we acquire it not via crafting, or just having stuff spawned into our inventories, but instead through a short quest line that sends us to investigate what happened to a now missing team of Vigilance of Stendar. It's a very short mission that shouldn't take 10 minutes to complete, but it's still appreciated. Overall, Revenants of the Forbidden Order, with its high-quality custom assets and associated mini-quest, really reminds me of official in-game Bethesda Creation Club content. The difference, of course, being that this mod is free, and won't break your script extender. Revenants of the Forbidden Order is available on both Skyrim versions on the PC, and, hopefully in a little bit, on the Xbox One eventually. Next on our list, how could we go without mentioning one of the most popular mods that released while we were away? The Combat Gameplay Overhaul, or CGO, by D Servant. A bit contrary to its name, I feel the best way to describe the combat gameplay overhaul is as a complete overhaul of Skyrim's entire movement system, with an emphasis on combat. Movement in Skyrim, especially when compared to more modern titles, has always been a bit robotic and somewhat primitive. If a character turns too quickly in any direction, they do this weird snappy thing, there's no mechanism for dodging, there's so many restrictions placed on how you can move when in combat in particular. No jumping while attacking, no moving while power attacking, no moving while attacking when both hands are full. You probably know what I'm talking about. And this is all what CGO is aiming to address through numerous alterations to Skyrim's animation system. Similar attempts have been made before with other mods in the past, but none I feel are quite this impressive. Once installed, the first thing you'll probably notice this mod introduces are new leaning mechanics. Rather than standing up straight 100% of the time, all the time, now characters' backs will lean, depending on their movement direction and speed. This already results in much more fluid turning, and even has effects in first-person mode. Notice the soft head bobbing on screen. Furthermore, all characters can now change their direction and movement speed when power attacking, and attack while mid-air, opening all sorts of Assassin's Creed-esque possibilities as you jump from rooftops onto your foes with daggers in hand. Speaking of daggers, all actors can also choose whether you carry any given weapon with one or two hands. 
What this means is that now any weapon can be considered either one or two-handed. It's up to you. Want to wield two great swords at once? No problem. How about dedicate both arms to a single dagger? Go for it. One-handing tends to allow for quicker attack speeds at the cost of damage dealt. The vice versa also applies. So there's some real advantages here. As you can see, numerous new animations have been created to accompany these possibilities. Finally, my favorite improvement made by CGO is the addition of dodge rolling. By simply pressing the sneak key while moving into any direction, though the exact controls are adjustable, we can now quickly perform a roll, which is extremely useful for dodging incoming attacks. We've seen many other mods try to add in a similar mechanic, try to allow us to dodge roll, but none are this fluid, and the leaning system makes everything look and feel supernatural. NPCs also can use this feature as well, though I will admit they're not the best at it. There's more going on here with the CGO. These are just the parts that I think are the most important. Be sure to check out the mod page for a full list of features. The combat gameplay overhaul is available on both Skyrim versions on PC, and unfortunately, due to its dependency on SKSE, probably won't make its way onto console anytime soon. Though our next mod certainly will. In fact, it already has. Coming in at number three, Rather than showcasing a single mod for this slot, we'll be taking a look at an entire bundle of mods by the same author that released between March and May of 2020. I give you the Slime Sire series by Slime Sire. Of course, as mentioned, this is available on both Skyrim versions on PC and the Xbox One. So when all the components are installed, the collection will introduce four new Dungeons to Skyrim. There's Fishbelly Grotto, a cave in the swamps of Morthal, the Underkeep, a large new series of tunnels beneath Riften's Ratways, Corvaxis, a large buried temple on an icy island in the Sea of Ghosts, and Zulfardin, a smaller cavern beneath the College of Winterhold's Midden. Now, here's the thing. If you haven't noticed, I'm using the term Dungeons when describing these locations, very loosely. Because the reality is, these places are quite a bit more than just dungeons. And honestly, some of them feel more like their own entire world spaces. With most being the size of like three or four Bleak Falls barrows, often taking well over an hour to clear. Furthermore, the design of each of the settings is remarkably creative and high quality. Not only in the very unique and almost alien-like visuals they employ, seriously, just look how breathtaking this stuff is, but also in their actual gameplay. While most vanilla and modded Skyrim dungeons usually just require you to fight your way through some enemies, Slime Sire series has a much deeper emphasis placed on being able to solve various puzzles and to locate hidden keys. Furthermore, each dungeon also ends up offering the Dragonborn a really nice player home, if that's something you're into. But enough generalizing, let's break all four down. I'll be light on spoilers, I promise. Bellyfish Grotto, the small cavern in the Hjolmarch swamps, initially feels like any other mundane Skyrim cave. But as we descend deeper and deeper, Various notes, as well as visual cues, begin to make it clear that this place is being corrupted by Periite, the Daedric god of pestilence, and has become a hub for some of his most deranged worshippers and frightening mutants. The extraterrestrial atmosphere and use of open spaces made this one a favorite of mine. Expect to spend a good 30 to 50 minutes to clear the entirety of this area. The Underkeep is probably my favorite favorite, though. A web of tunnels beneath Riften's Ratways that have become a sanctuary for worshippers of Vermina, Daedric Goddess of Nightmares. This one gets really cool, as not only are we again exposed to these unique visuals that make excellent use of Skyrim's lighting and assets, but around half of the experience will involve we the player actually entering a person's nightmare. Like, yeah, going inside of someone's dreams. And if you thought the last place featured alien environments, well, you're in for another surprise. Your journey here 
should last about an hour. Corvaxis, an ancient temple buried beneath a tiny island in the Sea of Ghosts, also gets a bit extra-dimensional, as it's revealed to be a former church to Molag Bol, Daedric Lord of Domination. And our trip through these crevices will ultimately lead us to Cold Harbor, Bol's Plane of Oblivion, that we'll have to escape via navigating a few floating islands and solving a bit of a puzzle. Roughly the same size as the Underkeep, expect conquering Corvaxis to take you another hour. Finally, Zoldarfin is the smallest of the new locations. Buried beneath the College of Winterhold's Midden, it once served as a sanctuary to worshippers of Namira, Daedric Goddess of Repulsion and the Foul. Honestly, this one's more or less just an oversized player home rather than a total dungeon. Like, it'll take maybe 5 or 10 minutes to explore, and the only enemies you'll find are a couple of frostbite spiders. Nonetheless, by player home standards, it's still pretty large. Anyway, that's a summary of all of the content. As you can tell, these new locales all maintain a theme inspired by a specific Daedra, and they all have a tale to be told as you explore and uncover notes. Any of these four areas could easily be sold to me as an official Bethesda Creation Club mod for real money, but the fact that we're getting all four of these world spaces for free is almost too good to be true. Even more baffling is the fact that collectively, Slime Sire series has less than a thousand Nexus downloads. Like, what? That is a crime. Seriously, and I mean no disrespect to any other mods, but this right here is quite possibly my favorite mod collection, or just mod in general, of the entire year. So the fact that it only has a thousand downloads just... It, it doesn't make any sense to me if I'm being totally honest. No matter, whatever the case, seriously, I can't recommend checking this one out enough. It's really what inspired me to make this entire video, and I think you'll have a blast. Anyway, you can find it on the Nexus, or Bethesda.net. For fourth spot, we've got something that may not be quite so DLC-sized, but still occupies a special place in my heart regardless. Supply and Demand by Twin Crows. Supply and Demand, or SND, is a mod that aims to overhaul Skyrim's economy by reflecting both available supply and potential demand of goods sold by merchants in their prices. What this essentially means is that if all of a sudden you start selling vendors, say, a ton of health potions, for example, say you sell a thousand of them, well, now because the vendors have so many and there's so many in circulation, the price of health potions across Skyrim will radically decrease, and they'll become much cheaper. Yet, at the same time, merchants will start offering you less gold for them when you're looking to sell. The opposite is also true. If you start buying, I don't know, a lot of clothes, well, then the price of clothes will start to rise, as merchants have less of them and other people still want to buy them. Yet now you can also resell your clothes for more. The way the mod works is shockingly simplistic. Every time an item is placed into or removed from a container, its value will suffer a 2% adjustment. Placing an item inside of a container decreases the value by 2%, whereas removing it increases it by the same number. Since all of Skyrim's merchants are treated like containers, everything works great. Furthermore, it means that stealing objects from people's inventories can also work to manipulate the markets. If you decide to start stealing everybody's shoes in a given city, well, then you can expect the price of shoes to rise, and then you can sell them for an even larger profit. Some various more minor adjustments have been made to this system by the author in an effort to prevent cheesing and ensure nothing gets too unreasonable, but that's the general gist of it. Furthermore, for the most immersive Skyrim economy, I'd recommend pairing SND with another mod called Trade and Barter by Cryptopyre, which, among a couple of other things, localizes prices based on region. So things like silver and iron, known to be in abundance around the Reach thanks to the mines, will be cheaper in Markarth, yet sell for a premium in less resource-rich areas, like Eastmarch. Combining these mods enables all sorts of interesting economic possibilities, and as someone who studied finance in college, you can imagine why I've fallen in love with them. 
Sure, they may not be adding in dozens of hours of new content or giving you an entire reason to restart a playthrough, but still, there's something I really appreciated. Now, for our next and last two spots of this video, I want to do something a little bit different. I want to talk about two mods that aren't out yet. Indeed, mods that are still in development, and provide some updates on where they're at, so we can get an idea of what to look forward to in the future. The first I want to glance at is Olenveld by Forcefield. Olenveld is a DLC-sized project I've talked a bit about before on this channel. It's a New Lands mod. Think something like Falscar or Beyond Skyrim Bruma. The aim of Olenveld is to send players to, well, the island of Olenveld, which according to the game's lore, is said to exist somewhere north of Skyrim in the Sea of Ghosts. Now, the history the games and books provide us on this place is shockingly sparse and vague. In fact, we don't even have any clue what Olenveld looks like on a map. But according to legend, when Tiber Septim was completing his conquest of Tamriel in the late Second Era, he used the island as a dumping ground for bodies and corpses. Since then, few people have ventured there, but rumor has it that due to all of the bodies, it's become a massive hub for necromancers and practitioners of the dark arts. Nearly two years ago, mod author Forcefield decided to take up the task of imagining what this place would be like during the events of The Elder Scrolls V, developing a map and story for it that would be compatible with what we know according to the lore, and he's come a shockingly long way. And by the looks of it, the finishing touches are finally being placed on the world space. Over the last few months, the author has been uploading various trailers and videos to his channel, showing off specific locations in this world, including, but not limited to, places like the Profaned Tower, one of many fortresses, likely built by Tiber Septim back when he came to this island, that since fallen into abandonment, and is now in the hands of darker forces. The Undead Mausoleum is another area, a massive foggy field of graves and tombstones, where the undead still lurk. Perhaps one of the most notable new environments Olenveld seeks to introduce is its Underworld, a massive subterranean series of catacombs and tunnels, where many of the bodies were once stored. The Underworld seems to be taking a lot of inspiration from Skyrim's own Blackreach dungeon, if any of you guys remember that place. Rather than being a relatively linear mission experience, it looks like the Underworld is supposed to be a big open-air environment for us to explore, which is very exciting. Furthermore, some other notable improvements include the development of many new characters and NPCs, as well as the addition of some entire soundtracks for the project. And the fact that this is all mostly the work of just a single guy makes the whole thing even more impressive. After nearly two years of development, the hope is for Olenveld to release sometime in 2020, or in 2021. Whatever happens, I'm very, very happy to see all this progress made. And finally, the last project I'd like to take a look at is still a bit earlier in its infancy, but nonetheless just as ambitious. Introducing Cathonicwe, The Fractured Isles. Like Olenveld, this mod 2 aims to send players to a rather ambiguous and vague location in the Elder Scrolls' lore. Specifically, the island, or as the authors are presenting it, the Isles of Cathonicwe. Most of what we know about this place comes from the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, specifically a couple of in-game books. Evidently, Cathonicwe is located somewhere between Tamriel and the mysterious far eastern continent of Akavir. While it's never been mapped before, sometime in the mid-third era, Emperor Uriel Septim V set out to expand his dominion beyond Tamriel, and he set sail to conquer Akavir. Along the way, to capture a sort of midpoint, he took over the Isles of Cathonicwe, and documented a little bit about it before continuing his journey to Akavir. Long story short, Uriel V's journey failed miserably. In fact, I made an entire video on it if you'd like to check it out. Link in the description. But nonetheless, the mod authors have a lot to work with, given that what I've just described is literally all we know about the place. It too is not documented on any maps. The storyline the mod authors are preparing to tell looks to be a very intriguing one. 
Evidently, since Uriel's failed expedition, Imperial influence on the area has faded. However, recently, thanks to the discovery of an important natural resource, the Empire's East Empire Company has taken an interest once again, and seeks to reassert the Imperial presence across Cathonic Way. The plot is set to be presented as a jockey for power between these major factions, both Imperial and Native. It's still a project very, very early in its development. However, the modders have already produced quite a bit of concept art. And I can assure you, they've done a bit of work in-engine as well. Though, they still want to wait to share that element. Whatever the case, Cathonic Way will be out... Uh, eventually. Probably in a couple years from now. Either way, I'll be waiting patiently. And with that, we are going to wrap up our latest episode of Immersive Skyrim Mods. To be quite frank, I'm not sure what specific episode number we're on, though at the end of the day, I guess it doesn't matter. Either way, thanks so much for watching, everybody. Which of these mods was your own personal favorite, or which one are you the most hyped to check out? Leave a comment down below. As always, like ratings are very much appreciated. Again, thanks for stopping by, and hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everyone.